war was released by the Taliban two weeks ago, and almost immediately the media and politicians have approached his story with skepticism, and as details continue to emerge that Bergdahl may have been a deserter, he's generating even more controversy. Critics have said that the trade for five Taliban prisoners was inappropriate and that at least six American soldiers lost their lives in the search for Bergdahl. They've even gone so far as to criticize his father's beard. So what does it mean to be a war zone deserter? And if Bergdahl did desert, was it wrong to negotiate for his release? Joining me now to discuss, we have HuffPost senior military correspondent David Wood, national security writer for the Washington Post, Dan Lamoth, and Greg Rinke, managing partner at Tully Rinke Law Firm, specializing in military law. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. So, Thanks for having us. Oh, absolutely. Dan, let's just start with how common desertion is. You wrote a piece for the Washington Post saying that Bergdahl had joined the company of a number of others throughout the Iraq War. So with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, how common was desertion? Uh, I think the big distinction here is that uh, desertion is somewhat common. Uh, war zone desertion, uh, deserting a unit while actually deployed in a war zone. Uh, in, in modern conflicts, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan has been very uncommon. When was the last time we saw someone uh, desert while in a war zone? Uh, there's a handful of cases that came up. Uh, I, I referenced one of them uh, One of them in that piece. It was a uh, Marine Corporal Hassoun. Um, he was believed to uh, have uh, been kidnapped initially from Iraq back in 2004. Uh, but as the case progressed, um, he resurfaced in Lebanon where he had family. Uh, came back home. Um, the, the Marine Corps eventually charged him with desertion. Uh, he came back to his unit and then deserted again. Uh, he's never been, to my knowledge, back to the United States. Uh, at, at last check in 2011 or 2012, he was back in Lebanon and seeking a book deal. Mm -hmm. Now, we, I want to pull up some of uh, Bergdahl's letters, which give us reason to, at the very least, speculate that he may have been a deserter in the war zone. But, David, uh, before we even bring up those letters, how do we actually determine whether someone is a deserter or not? Uh, well, it could be in the court of public opinion, which is probably the worst way to do that, and that's what's happening now. A better way, I think, and I hope this really happens, is that once he's uh, mentally secure enough to come back to the United States, uh, that he go through what's called an Article 32 hearing under the Military Code of Uniform, Uniform Code of Military Justice. It's basically a grand jury hearing uh, where you have prosecutors and defense attorneys and a judge and so forth. And, uh, and that's the place where there can be a, a, a dispassionate, calm consideration of the actual facts. We haven't had that at all today. We don't know if he deserted. We don't know if he walked off. We don't know basically anything except rumor and innuendo. And I think it's extremely damaging, and I'd like to talk about that later. Absolutely. Let's, let's pull up uh, the piece from the Michael Hastings Rolling Stone article. Uh, many think it's the best window into Bergdahl's frame of mind. Uh, he quotes at length from Bo Bergdahl's emails uh, home describing his experience in Afghanistan. He wrote openly about walking away, saying, quote, Returning to Alaska after Christmas, Bo said something that would stick with Fry months later, long after they arrived in Afghanistan. Before we deployed, when we were on uh, Rear D, him and I were talking about what it would be like, Fry recalls. Bo looked at his friend and made no bones about his plans. He said, if this deployment is lame, I'm just going to walk off into the mountains of Pakistan. Now, David, this is clearly being used against Bergdahl at this point. Bergdahl has no chance to speak for himself. Is it inappropriate that we're using this to speculate about uh, Bergdahl's desertion, possible desertion? What? Well, yes, it is. I mean, you know, here's a, here's a, a pretty young person who, um, who grew up homeschooled, pretty isolated from the rest of American culture, uh, all of a sudden thrust into the military. And, uh, you know, who knows what his frame of mind are? You know, listen, uh, uh, I, I am not a, I, I've never served in the military, but I spent my whole career basically embedded with grunts. And while I don't speak for them, I think I know them pretty well. And this kind of you know, boasting around and, and, and stuff. I don't think we need to take that um, per se. I would like to see this all examined, as I said, in a court of law. Abs absolutely. Are you essentially saying, though, that uh, saying that he's going to, if it's lame, he's going to walk off into the mountains of Pakistan is essentially just sort of macho boasting, thinly, thin threats that don't really mean much and that this happens fairly regularly 
with disenchanted soldiers? Well, listen, my notebooks are full of, you know, <laughs> stuff that grunts say, uh, and I'm like, well, I'm not going to write that because it would get you in trouble or you don't really mean it or whatever. I mean, look, it, you know, these folks are pretty young. Uh, many of them are away from home the first time. Uh, you know, there's this sort of macho culture of dare and counter dare that goes on. I don't think we should take that seriously mm -hmm. at this point. Greg, how severe is the crime of desertion? Well, the crime of desertion is, is, is very severe, especially in time of war. Uh, if you desert your unit in time of war, it's punishable by ultimately the death penalty. Um, desertion stateside from a, a unit is punishable by life imprisonment, uh, confinement. So the, the crime of desertion is, is fairly uh, severe, especially in time of war. What's the, what's the main difference between desertion and going AWOL, and how do we determine uh, that? Well, AWOL is absence without leave. Um, desertion is basically when you're absent from your unit, you desert your unit, and you have no intent to come back. You have to formulate a intent to basically desert your unit and intend to never come back to your unit. So they are very different crimes. Mm -hmm. If it's confirmed that Bergdahl did intend to dissent, how, how could he be punished? Well, if he intended to desert, I, I think he'll be charged. Uh, charges will be preferred against him after an investigation. Uh, punishment could range anywhere from an administrative discharge um, to potential confinement. Um, however, I think there's a lot of other issues in play in this case. Uh, mental health issues are definitely going to come out, especially uh, in the defense of, of this uh, soldier. Because even if he walked off his, his, his uh, fire base, something just doesn't sound right about a soldier just walks off into the mountains of Afghanistan. So there's clearly going to be mental health issues that are going to come into play. Greg, how does an investigation like this play out? Because it seems to me the only evidence we currently have are these emails and these conversations that Bergdahl uh, sent to his family and had with other soldiers, which, as, as David said, you know, he's got journals full of soldiers boasting, having, you know, being... Uh, disenchanted with the war and their efforts as uh, servicemen. So at the same time, and then at the same time, all we have is what Bergdahl is going to say. I don't think Bergdahl is necessarily going to come to full health and say, yes, I deserted, charge me. So what do we actually have to investigate here? Well, I think what needs to be investigated is, is the surrounding circumstances at the time. They're going to talk to other soldiers within the unit. And it's my understanding that an investigation has already been done five years ago. So they're going to relook at the findings of that investigation, and they're going to try and corroborate uh, some of those findings um, by talking to uh, Bergdahl. However, he's likely going to uh, invoke his Article 31 rights, which are basically he does not need to cooperate in the investigation. Uh, he has the right to have a military defense counsel appointed. So uh, it, it's not the most easy of cases for them to investigate um, with, uh, with the soldier cooperating, because if I was representing the soldier, I would advise him likely not to make any statements. So they're going to be left basically with the investigation from five years ago and any surrounding facts that are going to come out um, now. Mm -hmm. David, how do service members gen gen generally view des uh, desertion? Oh my God, with horror and revulsion. I mean, look, the thing that holds a unit together on the battlefield is, is this pledge you know, I will die for you, and I know you will die for me. You're watching my back, I'm watching your back, and it's a unit that, that coheres together in a very, very strong bond. If somebody walks off, it shatters that bond, and, and you know, I think in many ways makes that unit um, unable to perform in combat. Um, you know, if you can't absolutely depend on the guy beside you or the guy behind you, um, you know, it makes it very difficult to take the kind of risks that uh, young service men and women take in combat. So it's extremely corrosive to have someone walk off uh, if that's what happened in this case. And, um, um, and the other thing that's happening, the other thing that's extremely corrosive here is, you know, the notion that every service man and woman goes to war with, and that is the conviction, the absolute certainty that if they get caught on the battlefield, their country will do anything to get them back. Well, now we have, uh, you know, imagine if you're a PFC or a, or a young, um, you're a young officer out on the battlefield watching this horrendous debate going on about whether this trade was worth it or not. 
And you've got to be wondering, gee, you know, if I get captured on the battlefield, these guys back in Washington are going to be looking at everything I've said and done and trying to weigh, you know, is this guy really worth getting back? And that's got to be, uh, you know, a, a, a really corrosive thing for, you know, our combat troops to start wondering. I, uh, it's, it's just a bad situation. I, I completely gr agree about the corrosive nature, but I'm curious if what's also cor corrosive is critics conflating desertion with being a traitor. Are we essentially seeing... Uh, the majority of critics, mostly on the right at this point, really conflating or not understanding the difference between being a deserter, a conscientious, conscientious objector, and a turncoat here. Well, look, it's, um, it's election campaign season, so a lot of silly things are said. A lot of people who've never served in the military are standing up on their two feet and yelling about all kinds of things. Um, that's why, again, um, you know, I hope that at some point we can move this discussion into a courtroom where there can be a dispassionate examination of the facts. Um, uh, you know, if it comes to that, I hope that uh, Sergeant Bergdahl will testify. I think it's important that he be given a chance to speak on his own behalf. Um, it's just, you know, trying to adjudicate this in the court of of ignorant public opinion is it's just corrosive and bad all the way around. Do you think this uh, ignorant court of public opinion is really bad for troop uh, morale right now? Well, as I say, if I was uh, serving out downrange somewhere and watching this debate on Fox or anywhere, um, I, you know, as I say, I would begin to wonder if I get caught, is this going to happen to me? Uh, you know. Think back about some of the emails I wrote questioning the war effort or whatever, and you have people in Washington, politicians, determining whether it's worth getting me. Whereas up until now, that question hasn't arisen. Anybody who's captured is, you know, gets um, the, the respect and the full effort of the United States to get it back. Mm -hmm. Now that's no longer true. Now, now what we're saying is, well, it kind of depends on who you are and what you've done, and we'll look at your record and decide whether you're worth retrieving or not. That's, that's got to be really corrosive. I'd like to hear what Dan has to say on that. Yeah, I just, I'm going to take that to Dan right now. Dan, do you think we're essentially differentiating a POW based on his supposed military performance? I mean, I think that's an issue. Um, I, I think the other thing that's really inflamed this, um, this situation to start was... Uh, uh, the Obama administration, at least initially, cast this as uh, Bergdahl as a, you know, potential war hero or likely war hero, and, and perhaps we don't know the circumstances, and he was kidnapped off the base or something to that effect. But there was plenty of background out there on this case, uh, and and plenty of previous reporting and, and plenty of previous discussions that suggested it was more complicated than that. Um, if they were looking to get a cheap win on this, uh, and and didn't really think that that would come up. Um, I, I was a little, I scratched my head initially. Uh, you know, you had the initial outrage on, on, on Saturday night into Sunday about, you know, well, who is Bergdahl and is he really a, really a hero? I, I think to have cast him that way initially um, without uh, acknowledging the, the complicated nature of this particular case was, was a problem. And I think the, you know, the, uh, the anger that came very quickly thereafter is partly because of that. But do you think the anger is warranted, or is a certain amount of confusion and discussion warranted? I think it's some of, some of both. I think it's tough to, um, you know, completely, you know, cast him as a deserter without, without uh, as David said, a, a, fair, a, fa a fair day in court here. But um, to have not even acknowledged that this was a complicated case with complicated details and, you know, perhaps not necessarily a feel-good story 100% of the way through, uh, that's, that's, that's a problem. The discussion of Bergdahl's character and his feelings about the war have been uh, all over the, uh, all, all over Fox News this weekend. This Rolling Stone piece uh, also quotes him uh, showing even more doubt about the mission in Afghanistan. Hastings wrote, uh, quote, I am sorry for everything here, Bo told his parents. These people need help, yet what they get is the most conceited country in the world telling them that they are nothing and that they are stupid, that they have no idea how to live. He then referred to what his parents believe may have been a formative, possibly traumatic event, seeing an Afghan child run over by an MRAP, 
Uh, he said, quote, we don't even care when we hear each other talk about running their children down in the dirt streets with our armored trucks. We make fun of them in front of their faces and laugh at them for not understanding we are insulting them. Uh, Greg, does it matter that he had issue with the war? Could that be used in a trial against him? We clearly see it being used in the ignorant court of public opinion, as, as David put it. Uh, but can we see that used in a military trial? Well, I, I think the fact that he had problems with the war doesn't equate to the fact that, you know, he became a deserter. Um, I mean, obviously, it could be circumstantial evidence of his intent, but I think we have to be careful. Soldiers have opinions. All soldiers do, but they execute their missions. They might not agree with politics, um, but they execute their missions. So to say that just because he didn't agree with, with the war or how it was being executed equates to him becoming a deserter, I think is a, is a, is, is a dangerous proposition and a road to go down. At this point, Bergdahl hasn't been able to speak for himself, but we have uh, family members of those who died in, in possible searches for him saying that Bergdahl is to blame for their, their family members, their friends' deaths in the search, and that they died in vain searching for, quote, a deserter. Uh, Dan, is it standing operating procedure to carry on a search like this for an American POW, be them a deserter or someone who had feelings against the war? I mean, if you have an American that, that's missing in a war zone, you're going to do whatever you can to find him, regardless of the circumstances. So I, I don't think it would have been a surprise that we would have done that for any American soldier or, or any service member. David, how do you feel about how family members and friends coming forward and uh, stating their disillusionment with the search for Bergdahl? I, I don't condemn them for that. Look, none of us, or at least I, have never lost a child in combat. I can't imagine the anguish and, and despair that, that follows something like that. So, you know, gosh, uh, grieving parents, blaming somebody else for their son's death, um, you know, <laughs> I really can't condemn them for that. But again, we don't know the facts, we don't know the circumstances, and I just hope at some point we can move out of this uh, discussion and debate and back into uh, the land of facts. Absolutely. And part of this discussion and debate uh, that Dan brought up was the way that the Obama administration first handled essentially the PR campaign of bringing Bergdahl home, calling him a, a, a war hero, and that being a bit confused and sort of covering up the murkiness of the actual conversation. But David, do you think this would have played out completely differently if this was Bush bringing home the last POW in the Afghanistan war? Um, well, I don't think it does any good to compare one president to another, but I think in this case, the White House was so divorced from the reality of um, the world of enlisted soldiers in which uh, Bowie Bergdahl lived. Uh, I don't think they had any idea how strongly people would feel about this. And, uh, you know, I mean, this White House has been famously uh, separated from the military. And it's been one of the difficulties this administration has had all along is that I don't think they really get the military mind. And uh, that's created a lot of problems over the last several years. So, and, and especially in this case, like I say, I think they had no idea how strongly people would feel about this, that there were, if there were charges of desertion, people would take that extremely seriously, especially the families of those soldiers lost uh, in the subsequent hunt for Sergeant Bergdahl. So, uh, you know, clearly it was a big, big time error on the part of the White House. And, and, and look, this, this issue has su touched something really deep in the American psyche that I think many people in Washington don't don't understand it, and in particular in this White House. This issue is not going to go away. This is big, and uh, it's going to spell trouble for the White House for a long time to come. Um, this issue has become such a big story that uh, last night, even Miss Louisiana thought she should chime in after a question posed to her from 90210's Ian Ziering. She had this to say to the question. And we have judge number four, Ian Ziering. Your question, please. In recent weeks, the U.S. has released five detainees from Guantanamo in exchange for one U.S. soldier held captive in Afghanistan. The U.S. policy is to leave no soldier behind. Do you think it's fair to sacrifice or swap lives in order to uphold this policy? 
I am glad that we got our guy back. However, I do not feel it is right that we subject ourselves to these acts of terrorism. I do agree with our guy being back, but however, I do not think we should, should subject ourselves. Thank you. We are our own cultural worst enemies. David, Dan, Greg, thanks so much for joining me and having this conversation. Pleasure talking to you guys. Thanks, Ricky. Yeah, keep watching HuffPost Live. We got a lot more coming up next.